Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, sodium derangements. It's something you see a lot in the hospital. And this is not going to be like a super in-depth physiologic review. It's more like a practical approach to help you on boards. And then I think one of the things that really helps people cement it is doing cases. So we'll finish it up with some cases on, on how to approach these, these patients. Whoops. It's automatically going for it. Okay. So this is one of the most important diagrams in medicine. This is how the glomeruli look in the kidneys. So the main things you need to understand is that you pump sodium, potassium, and chloride out in the ascending loop of Henle, and you do a sodium, potassium, hydrogen exchange uh, based off aldosterone in the distal convoluted tubule, and then our collecting duct opens aquaporins with ADH, and the water flows out according to the gradient of the sodium. So sodium goes out, I mean the water comes out following the sodium that we've pumped out with the other parts of our system. The balance of that is kept in equilibrium by a counter-osmotic force of the remaining solute in urine, which is primarily urea. So almost all the solute components of urine are urea plus sodium. And this kind of leads into the next main, main concept of hyponatremia and hypernatremia, which is one of the dissociations that you have to make is that sodium really doesn't have to do with sodium concentration. So a lot of times people look at it and think that person's lost sodium, or they've gained sodium, that's really not the primary issue here. This is all about water. So if we have a patient um, who holds on to extra sodium, which is managed by aldosterone, that person's total body sodium will go up. And as a result of increased sodium, they will start to swell, get edema, get all those hypervolemic type states. And if they lose it, they'll become hypovolemic. But if we just change aldosterone, we don't change sodium concentration our patient will still retain the water that's controlled by that gradient in the kidneys and maintain the same sort of normal values we expect. On the flip side, if we suddenly give someone a lot of water into their bloodstream, we can change the concentration of that very easily. And that's again managed by ADH. So primarily we're talking about dysregulation of ADH. So this doesn't really have to do with sodium, even though we're talking about sodium. So we'll start off with the, the most common issue you see, which is hyponatremia. So hyponatremia, this is kind of the classic presentation. I don't find this particularly uh, important to how I think of it, but if there's pseudohyponatremia, hyperosmolar hyponatremia, and then there's our high ADH type states, our true hyponatremia. So pseudo generally means there's something that's messing with the test, like triglycerides, total protein. And then hyperosmolar hyponatremia is when we have an extra sugar or alcohol that's pulling water into the intravascular space and diluting the sodium. So it is actually a true hyponatremia, but it's from something that's generally kind of correctable or that we're monitoring. And then our high ADH states went off a general principle we see in medicine, which is uh, we have to maintain our blood pressure. So if a patient becomes acutely ill or hypovolemic or their heart's not pumping well, their blood pressure starts to go down. And so our body releases a bevy of hormones to try to regulate that. It ups aldosterone, but we don't have easy access to sodium, right, unless we're in a hospital and we're giving it to people through their veins. So if we're an animal, we wouldn't have quick access to that. That's a more of a chronic fix, but it does go up. We release norepinephrine, epinephrine, we release cortisol, we release all these hormones, but we also release ADH. And we do that because our body generally has a limited grab bag of things to work with. So vasopressin does multiple things in our body, ADH. So it controls some of your emotional centers in your brain, it controls your sodium concentration, but it also vasoconstricts, and you may see that in the ICU when we use it as a presser. So our body releases it in response to underperfusion, but the trade-off is that we lose tonicity. So all of this is about trying to maintain our blood pressure in a lot of these states, or releasing an inappropriate system. Uh, under the hyperosmolar hyponatremia, I'm going to have this on a couple slides. This is one of the most important things, and especially at the beginning of the year, I see residents be like, this person's hyponatremic, and they start ordering all these tests, and then I, my first question is, what was the glucose? Because the most common cause of hyperosmolar hyponatremia is hyperglycemia. So you need to memorize this. There's two large papers done on this. One of the original ones came up with a median value of 1.6 change in sodium per 100 change of glucose. That's a really old paper. A more modern paper was done that tracked it throughout multiple glucose ranges. It actually can even go up to four, so it varies depending upon your degree of hyperglycemia. So it's somewhere between 1.6 to four. Most patients will fall in a range of around 2.4. Mathematically, make your life simple so you don't even need a calculator, just do two for every 100 change. That's a more 
accurate modern thing. I know a lot of medical student stuff still have 1.6, but I would do two per 100. You just have to be in the ballpark to know if it's probably not relevant in a case. So just do that in your head the moment you see hyponatremia, immediately look at the glucose. And then you save a lot of unnecessary workups. So this is kind of the classic table that divides up the broad categories of hypernatremia. So pseudohyponatremia, like we said, is from tri total protein more than 10 or triglyceride more than the 800s. That's sort of a historical footnote. We use more modern tests nowadays that do not actually get fooled by these interactions with the probes. So maybe if you were in a, a third world country or in an older hospital, potentially this could happen. The board still could potentially ask you this, which is why it's still here. Um, and we'll talk about it when we get into testing. Hyperosmolar hyponatremia does exist. It still happens. We actually just had a case on our team uh, where a patient needed an ophthalmology procedure and they had a high intraocular pressure and they used mannitol to try to reduce it for glaucoma in an acute setting and the wrong dose of mannitol was infused. They ran way too much in on the patient and their sodium dropped from normal to 128 in the span of a short period of time then it came back up and it was like we really don't need to work up to that because we know the person got mannitol. The mannitol pulled the water in, it did that. Now sorbitol and all those you do need to know because you could get tricked by this. I've seen a case before, IVIG used to be dissolved in sorbitol, I think it's now galactol, they do different substances, but it's all the same concept, these sugars pull it in. So we had a patient getting IVIG and someone checked a BMP while the IVIG was running, like right after it, I guess, not during it. And the patient's sodium plummeted after the infusion. It's this sort of effect from these sugars. Once the sugar is gone from your body, it goes away. The one that people do like mentioning, it's rare, but it's, it's something that's more likely to cause a severe, is during hysterectomies or TERPs, they actually infuse sorbitol classically into the uh, bladder. They use some other sugars now, and because of the tears in the bladder and all that, you can absorb it, and it can cause severe hyponatremia following a, a uh, urologic procedure. All right, so those are kind of our aside ones, our sort of, I know they're not really pseudo. Pseudo is its specific thing with the test, but there are false hyponatremias. Now we're gonna talk about the ones that are more clinically relevant. So our clinically relevant hypernatremias are divided into hypervolemic, euvolemic, and hypovolemic. And when we talk about that, we're really talking about what is the total body sodium concentration of the patient. So in a hypervolemic state, we have high aldosterone, we're holding onto a lot of sodium and we swell. So we actually have too much sodium, but we're hyponatremic because our body is releasing a lot of ADH to try to make up for it. So if we have really bad, we're not talking about minor cases, we have really bad heart failure, like somewhere with a 10% EF. If we have really bad end-stage cirrhosis where I'm about to go into hepatorenal syndrome in bad shape, now I can start, and I have ascites, now that patient can start becoming hyponatremic from the ADH release. And actually, interestingly, in cirrhosis, high ADH levels and hyponatremia are strongly correlated with the risk of hepatorenal. So this is a sign that your blood pressure issues are becoming very severe in these patients. So it's still too much ADH. Dialysis patients can get it through misbehaving. So if my kidneys don't excrete anything and I drink way more water than what the nephrologist is telling me to, I can become hyponatremic. So that one's not really the same mechanism of ADH, uh, but it is under the hypervolemic states because usually they're volume overloaded as well in those scenarios. All right, so those are the kind of the big category for, for hypervolemic. Hypovolemic hyponatremia is also a high aldosterone state where I have too much total body sodium. Oh, sorry, but in this case, I have too little body sodium. So in this disease, what happens is I've lost a lot of sodium from vomiting, sweating, diarrhea, something like that. And as a result of that loss of sodium, I'm underperfused and I release ADH to try to fix it. I'm also releasing aldosterone. And the reason I'm mentioning the aldosterone, it'll come into play with the testing that we're going to go over coming up. So when I get a result in these patients, um, I'm going to have a high DH and a low aldosterone. And again, I see runs all the time try to say lots of people have hypovolemic hyponatremia, but you really need some sort of insult to cause that, like vomiting, sweating, diarrhea. It's not just someone's not eating well. If a patient was not eating and drinking well, they would actually become hypernatremic from their lack of intake and lack of free water. Does that make sense? So it is a cause of that. All right. Then we have our euvolemic causes. And euvolemic causes are from an excess of ADH, but generally normal aldosterone levels. So we are not underperfused. We just have something else is generally raising our release of ADH. So this could be any stress, because your body does respond to stress and shock by releasing ADH. So you'll see it commonly in surgical patients. If someone gets a major operation and under stress, they do release high levels of ADH. They can go down to like 130 after that. 
But what we're talking about here is really bad cases that cause a profound change in it. So please don't work up people who are like 131, 130. Generally, I won't bother to work people up unless they're 128 or lower because you're going to spend a lot of time chasing around all the minor things. So pneumonia, anything can make you 130 from the stress response. So what we're talking about here, though, generally is does the person have adrenal insufficiency, profound hypothyroidism, or do they have a tumor? secreting ADH or are they on a medication that produces too much ADH? And when we say that, we're talking about psychiatric drugs, seizure drugs. That's kind of the, the classic spectrum of that. Um, the other possibility when we have euvolemic hyponatremia is we have low solute hyponatremia, which is T and toe, severe potomania, and polydipsia. Um, so I'm going to go through the steps on how to work it up, and we'll talk a little bit more about T and toast under that. So when you do it, truthfully, the best way to think about these cases is not even really the table. It's just to follow an algorithmic approach to trying to sort it out. And it's very formulaic for hyponatremia, and it works very, very well. So the first step for a board exam, certainly, is to do a serum osmolarity. In our practice here, it's less useful because we don't really have pseudohyponatremia. So the idea is if I have a calculation, and this is actually the Gardner formula, which is a simplification of the real formula. These aren't the real numbers, but it ends up being close. Two times sodium plus uh, glucose divided by 18 plus BUN divided by 2.8. If you add those up, you can calculate someone's osmolarity. So a shortcut idea is if I doubled someone's normal sodium at 140, it would be 280, correct? But my patient is hyponatremic, ideally less than 130. So there's no way, unless my BUN and glucose are completely out of whack, that I could possibly be over 280. So it should be less than 280. If it's over 280, it has to be that there's something else in there increasing the osmolarity, meaning it's either their pseudohyponatremia and it's a bogus test result, or the patient has... Um, has a, a sugar or an alcohol or something that's pulling it in. One thing that'll confuse you guys a lot that I see, especially here at UofL, is we'll order a hyponatremia test on someone who's an alcoholic and they just chugged a bunch of booze and their serum alcohol levels through the roof, and you'll get an osmolarity that's over 280. Really, you need to do it on someone who's not actively drunk. So you need to wait for it to get out of their system before you do that. And there are some papers that severe alcohol might be able to lower your sodium as well. So really, you need to let that get out of their system before you can use a serum osmol. So I do see residents getting confused a lot on those cases because we'll come back and we'll have like a, a 285 you know, osmolarity because of that. Um, so we look at it. If it's more than 280, then we say it's pseudo or it's from the sugar. And if it's less than 280, then we would say that the patient has what we expect and we need to continue our workup. Okay, that's a board thing. In the real world, we just say, are they on sorbitol, mannitol, one of these drugs, like we just talked about with that case, and what is their glucose? So if you look at the patient's glucose and it's through the roof, just do that equation to correct it, and then maybe you don't need to order any tests. Does that make sense? We really don't need a serum osmol to tell us that if the person's blood sugar is really high and it corrects up to a 130 or higher, something where we wouldn't really care. All right? So step number two is to look at our urine osmolarity. And when, if you remember on my previous slide, what we're really doing with these cases is we're looking at these hormones I talked about, aldosterone and ADH. So what we're doing with the urine osmolarity is we're indirectly looking at someone's ADH. So if a patient has a very high ADH value because they're dying of dehydration in a desert and they're trying to absorb as much water as possible, their urine osmolarity would be around 1,700. And if a patient is chugging gallons of water and peeing constantly, their ADH would be turned off and their urine osmolarity would be around 50. So we're going to have some sort of gradient in between those ranges based off ADH. So ADH would be an expensive test. We'd have to send it off. So it's not very practical. So we use a very cheap test, which is our urine osmol, to substitute that. So we're, we're measuring their ADH values. So if I measure that and I chugged a bunch of water, my urine osmolarity is going to be close to that 50. And what we use for, for practicalities, we say any value under 100 would be a very dilute urine, which is what I expect to see. So that means either I'm a normal person chugging water, which is polydipsia, or I have a low solute state. And what does that mean? Um, and by the way, if it's over 100, then it doesn't tell you squat. So 
doesn't really matter that much. Really high values do make it risky to give them normal saline. You should be aware of that. Over 400, there's a risk of making them worse. But um, as a general rule, we only care if it's less than 100. So what is a low solute hyponatremia? So residents and all love saying someone could have beer potomania, but we need to understand the concept. So again, we're back to our kidney diagram. So we get this high concentration of sodium and we absorb water through that mechanism. That's opposed, because it's a total osmotic gradient, by the, uh, what is it, the, the solute content of the urine. So solute, like we talked about, the urine is normally 600 to about 900 milliosmoles of solutes that are there in the main constituents, which are sodium, and the other major constituent of urine is urea. So if we're pumping a bunch of sodium out into our interstitium, then what we're really saying is creating that overall gradient is the balance between the sodium in the interstitium, the sodium inside the tubule, and the urea in the tubule. So since the sodium is all being regulated in these other systems, what we're really saying in a low solid state is that 600 to, eight, 600 to 900 has plummeted because the person does not have urea. So when I lose urea, that little arrow, the, the blue arrow I have, is no longer there creating a counter gradient, and actually too much water then flows out. I actually don't have enough ability to hold water and put it into my kidneys and then pee it off. So my urine output of free water drops off, I end up holding on to too much water and I become hyponatremic. So how do I do that? It's because urea um, is primarily dietary. So if I, and what do I mean by that? So urea is produced through protein catabolism. So if a patient is not eating any protein in their diet, then the urea not there to absorb, and therefore it starts dropping in their urine. However, if I starved myself and I didn't eat, I wouldn't be getting dietary protein, but I would start eating myself. And if I start breaking down my own cells and catabolizing mainly muscle, I'm going to start releasing urea from that process. So I don't get this from starvation. I get this from actually having plenty of calories but having no protein in my diet. Because if I have plenty of calories, I don't break down my muscles, so I don't produce endogenous urea, but I'm also not eating it. So that's why it's tea and toes, beer potomania. It's from eating a lot of starches without any protein. So starches are nutritionally worthless. They're a good source of calories, but they don't have a lot of things we need. So um, we had a, a patient not too long ago who was vegan, and they weren't eating any beans. They were literally just eating starch stuff. You can see that. Uh, vegan stuff, overall pretty risky for us, had severe B12. It was actually so low the lab couldn't even measure it. Um, so that's one possibility. You can also have uh, patients who are just eating, uh, drinking soda, things like that. But the classic example is people chugging beer. Beer has a lot of calories, but it has no protein. So that's what beer potomania is. So if you have a case where it's less than 100 and the person's not drinking excessively, then you would think that that may be what's going on with them, and you need to get a history of what their nutrition is and what they're doing that could be causing that. All right. um, and then the easiest way to tell if your patient could have beer potomania or tea and toast, the slow solid state, is we do measure urea. So the patient has to have a very, very low BUN on their blood test. If their BUN is 22, they probably have plenty of urea in their urine. That's not going to be happening in that case. All right. Any questions? All right. All right. So then we go to our third step, and our third step is to look at urinary sodium. And urinary sodium is how we indirectly measure aldosterone. Remember our diagram? Hyper and hypovolemia have high aldosterone values. Euvolemic cases do not. So that's what we're doing with urinary sodium. We could measure serum aldosterone directly, and we do have that test, but it would be a send out. It'd take us forever to get the results. It'd be a little more complicated. So, when we do this, what we're going to say is basically, am I absorbing all the sodium or am I excreting a ton of sodium? Because if I'm underperfused, I should have high aldosterone, I should be absorbing sodium, and therefore my urinary sodium should be less than 20. We don't do phenas, we don't do anything else for this, we just look at the urine sodium, okay? Um, obviously, some things can mess with that. But when we take it, we're going to look at it and see. So if it's less than 20, it's either hypervolemic or hypovolemic. We can't tell it just off a blood test, but we hopefully can tell by looking at our patient, right? So once it's less than 20, it's got to be a high aldosterone state. So it's either heart failure, cirrhosis, or vomiting, diarrhea, sweating, or a thiazide diuretic. So we look at our patient and see what the results look like, all right? There is a problem with this. And then if it's over you know, 30, then we can say that they don't have uh, an issue with high aldosterone, meaning they're not underperfused, so it's a euvolemic case. 
Mainly we're looking for that value of less than 20. That's what you should be hyper-focused on. However, there is a problem. And this is the one thing I never see residents order. It is on boards. Both times I took it, they do give you this lab. And if you see one of these questions, you might wonder why it's there. They give you a serum uric acid. You can do urine uric acid. It's a little less popular. I'm just going to talk about serum today. So when you have a patient who has a underperfused state, they tend to absorb uric acid in the proximal tubules. And so the overall problem with this scenario is what if I have SIDH but I have high aldosterone? What if something else is wrong with me as well? Now I can get a misleading result in that patient. So therefore, in these patients, I also look at the uric acid. So if the patient's serum, urine sodium rather is less than 20, but their serum uric acid is four or less, then that would support that this is actually a euvolemic cause and not a true hypovolemic or hypovolemic state. Did that make sense to everyone? So please, when you order these workups, please start ordering a serum uric acid on them. Um, I, I can't, numerous times through the years, it'll come back, it's less than 20, it doesn't fit the clinical scenario, we'll get a serum uric acid and it's like three or something like that. So just go ahead and get in the habit of it, also help you with board exams. Like I said, last time I took it and the first time I took it, it's, it's on there as well. So they do like throwing that wrinkle at you, so just get in the habit of doing it. All right, any questions on the urinary sodium testing? There should be one, what if they're on diuretics, right? So hydrochlorothiazide does it. And we actually just had a patient on my team today, it was a different electrolyte issue, but you've got to realize a common concept with diuretics is that diuretics mess up urine tests. And it depends upon when you get it. So if I had a hydrochlorothiazide and I was taking it at home and I came in 24, 48 hours later and it's no longer in my bloodstream, my urine sodium would be less than 20, right? Because I'm hypovolemic from it. If I came into the ER and I was hyponatremic and I took it and it's still in my bloodstream, then my urine sodium would be more than 30 because it's a diuretic, it would make me excrete sodium, right? So just be aware, you can't also mess up your urine sodium results. I could give an SIDH patient a bunch of Lasix or something like that and I could also mess it up. So I really need these tests, ideally not on, on uh, diuretics. All right. So, Last general concept topic is now we've gone through our list, we've gotten everything out of the way, and all we have left is euvolemic. Once we know a patient is euvolemic, it's either SIDH, severe profound hypothyroidism. I've seen a few cases through the years. All the cases I had, the TSH was actually like 200. It was crazy high. Um, or you have adrenal insufficiency. 86 to 88% of people with, hypo, with uh, adrenal insufficiency have hyponatremia. It's one of the most common findings of it. So if I have someone who has uh, adrenal insufficiency, I need to check an 8 a.m. cortisol. So if I have a hyponatremic patient, I get in that euvolemic state, I need to check a TSH, and I need to check an 8 a.m. cortisol. I wanted to put this up so you guys know how to use cortisols. Uh, there's a lot of trickiness to it. Um, this is what's called a receiver operator curve, and it kind of gives you uh, the sensitivities on the y-axis, and it got cut off, but one minus specificity is on the x-axis. So each of the points on this line represent a specific lab result and then what its sensitivity and specificity is. And this is from a recent paper in New England Journal. This is some of the stuff they published up. So you can see that if I have a value of less than five in this scenario, that the patient has a 95% specificity for adrenal. So if I get that result, I can trust that it's probably adrenal. Now there is some impact of pretest probability, et cetera. If I get a value that's over 13 in this scenario, then there's a 96 sensitivity. So probably they don't have it. The reason I'm mentioning this is because if you go on up to date or you do things, what you do on this 8 a.m. cortisol is most people will accept less than three, and this is where your boards are gonna use. Less than three, you have adrenal, and more than 18, you don't have adrenal, okay? And that's because if we go to 18, that's like 99% likely to rule it out. And then if it's under three, it almost guarantees to rule it out. There is another caveat. There's two different cortisol total tests and the cortisol test um, can be 30% uh, or whatever it is. It's like 14 is the equivalent of 18 on that test. So you have to know which one you have, but general rule memorize less than three, more than 18. Last thing, cause I've seen this misused recently. If someone has hypovolemic shock on pressors, you can do a random cortisol, and if it's not over 18, that suggests adrenal. There are papers supporting that. I've seen the ICU doing it on people who are not on pressors, and then trying to say they have adrenal. Please don't do that. 
you have to have really bad scenario in order for your cortisol to be reliable in that case. So don't just order it randomly uh, other than that scenario. All right. Um, if we do get a case uh, where it's not adrenal or thyroid, then it's SIDH. We look through the drugs, again, seizure drugs, psych drugs. Um, TCAs could do it, which is, again, psych drugs. Um, we certain uh, drugs of abuse, so ecstasy is the most classic one. Can happen with some of our meth abusers as well. Usually that will be pretty rapidly reversible. Um, and then, again, is there a major trauma or something else to be increasing it, though usually those changes are mild. And finally, if there's no obvious cause, you would want to get a chest X-ray. Um, or if it's less than 120 on the sodium, uh, you, some experts recommend doing a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis. I actually do recommend that. If someone is bad enough to have like a seizure and you've done your full workup and it's SIDH and there's no drugs or anything, you probably need to go looking for a malignancy or you, know, you might even find an adrenal case you missed, something unexpected. So make sure you do the scans in, in those scenarios. All right, so does anyone know what this is a picture of? That's central pontine myelinolysis, right? So that's actually brain damage from correcting sodium too quick. So if we're going to treat people with acute hyponatremia, we generally want to shoot for a range between 6 to 10 millimoles per liter. Now, the actual literature is different. This is all kind of made up. The actual literature shows that a change between 18 to 24 in 48 hours is what causes it. No one's correlated it with 24, but they set you these daily goals, so hopefully you won't go over in two days. But as long as you can keep it under the two-day range, that's what the, the strongest literature really supports. But try to keep it on that range, and most experts recommend keeping it more on the sick side, unless the person's having extreme seizures and neurologic dysfunction with a really, really low value. All right, so what do we do to treat it? And I see this misdone all the time, especially by the ER. If someone has hypovolemic hyponatremia, you can give them normal saline because their volume depleted, that's why they're releasing ADH. If I give them normal saline, I fix their total body sodium deficit, and once it becomes normal, they stop releasing the ADH, right? And those patients will fix crazy fast. That's actually a problem with them as they usually normalize almost immediately. Um, so frequently, a lot of experts recommend you give them desmopressin before you start the normal saline even. Give them extra ADH to give them SIDH as you treat it. Uh, depends upon the acuity as well, though, whether you need to do that. Hypervolemic hyponatremia, we're not going to give them any sort of sodium because they're already total body sodium in excess. It might make their heart failure worse, et cetera. So we're going to focus on just diuresing them and fluid restricting them. And if that doesn't work, then we'll consider putting them on a VAPTAN therapy, which is an ADH antagonist, right? And there's several options for that. Uh, I think Conavaptan is the IV one. If we're euvolemic, this is kind of a, a simplified algorithm that, that's done for this. So in these scenarios, if the question is, am I less than 120 where it's dangerous, or is the patient actively having seizures? If they're not, they could go to a floor bed, and you would just fluid restrict them. The minimum fluid restriction should be one liter. I keep seeing residents order 1.5 liters. That's not a fluid restriction. A human being really only needs about 800 milliliters of fluid per day. So really 700 would really be a, a major fluid restriction, but really it's just whatever they're peeing. If you do less than that, they should start going up. Uh, but at least do one liter and a liberal salt intake in the patient. Again, this is euvolemic, not heart failure and cirrhosis. If the person is symptomatic, and what does that mean? I generally would say symptomatic is like they're completely comatose or they're having seizures. Then in that scenario, um, if they're symptomatic, you need to be very aggressive. If they're less, you still need to be aggressive, but not quite as much. So European and American guidelines differ on this. I'm going to give you the American guidelines. Um, the American guidelines are 100 milliliters of 3% sodium chloride given over 10 minutes. You run that in, and then you recheck their BNP in six hours, and you keep giving that over and over. And they really should be in a unit if you're doing this. Usually they won't give this on the floor. So anyone who's less than 120 really is supposed to be in an ICU, or at least a step down, wherever the nurses are willing to give it and you would give them this boluses. So they're not recommending the drips anymore. What they find is people don't follow the patients properly. They leave the drips running and they become hyponatremic. If you keep bolusing it and then doing it, the worst case scenario is you don't fully correct it. Does that make sense? Say so PM is very ugly. I saw a case where a guy, a resident corrected someone from 112 to 138 in under 24 hours. They are really proud of himself. <laughs> this, this is a long, long time ago. And the guy went home. CPM actually develops about three weeks later, three or four weeks later. 
the guy came back several weeks later, ended up being a quadriplegic, had to go to placement. It was a big mess. So it's, it's a very dangerous thing. So we want to be very cautious. So don't put them on drips and leave them. Most people are not recommending that now. Um, European guidelines are different. They say 150. So that's the only difference between American and European guidelines. They're a little more aggressive in Europe. You could do the 150 if you want to. Um, it's not necessarily wrong. Uh, in symptomatic cases, if the person's having a seizure, you just keep giving them those 100 doses every 10 minutes until their neurologic symptoms go away or you've given them 300. If you get to 300 and they're not corrected at that point, uh, or they're, and they're still having neurologic point issues at that point, you don't try to go more aggressive because you don't want to overcorrect it and cause a worse problem for that patient. Uh, but the idea here is we're trying to get them fixed up close to six as fast as possible. So we're not going to do the 100 milliliter aliquots you know, every six hours, essentially, we're going to give a bunch of it up front to try to fix it, and then we'll start doing the six hours after that. If you run into a problem where someone is overcorrecting, you can try D5W. It's not very effective. That's why most experts now recommend that you give people desmopressin, which I've written up there. So you can give desmopressin if you overshoot. Remember, overshoot, as long as you're under 10, you're probably okay. You want to keep them near six. But let's say you do the first one in the very first check, they shot up, then we probably want to be more cautious with that. All right, and again, a lot of experts recommend in the hypovolemic cases you give a dose of desmopressin before you start them on the aggressive fluid resuscitation because they are so hard to manage. All right, any questions? All right, chronically, we're going to fluid restrict people, and if that doesn't work, we don't jump to the super expensive VAPTAMs. We usually do salt tablets. Uh, the biggest issue I see with residents saying salt tablets don't work is they didn't give enough. So usually you're going to have to give, and there's a calculation for it, but you're going to usually have to start them at two tablets three times a day, and then based off their response, you go up or down on those doses. Does that make sense? You can do a teaspoon of salt instead of the salt tablets. That's been done. And interestingly, there was a paper where they had no ICU beds and no one would give 3% on the floor, so they gave people salt tablets and fixed an acute case. You can actually give salt tablets every hour and fix someone the same as 3% normal saline. So if there's some reason you can't do, not normal, 3% sodium chloride. So if you can't do 3%, you can do repeated salt tablets. Yes? What about giving supplemental urea gases? Are you talking about urea? Yeah. Yeah, that's recommended in the European guidelines. I haven't seen it in the American, but yes, that does work as well. Because remember, we talked about the solute in the urine is urea. So the idea is, and really this is the idea for all of these. I should have mentioned this actually is when we're giving someone 3%, we're not actually fixing it by giving them sodium. Because remember, sodium has nothing to do with this issue. What we really do is we give you so much salt, your kidneys start dumping it in your urine. And when your kidneys dump it, it pulls all that water out. So that's what we're doing with 3%. We're not actually giving the sodium to fix the concentration. We're giving it so your kidneys start pulling out a bunch of, of uh, water with the sodium, because water always falls sodium. You can do the same thing by giving someone really high doses of urea. So urea is the second most common constituent of your urine. If I give you a whole bunch of urea, now that gradient is favoring it going in. It, it opposes the movement out into the interstitium, and so therefore you do pull off more free water. That is, I didn't write that up. I mean, I'd look at it. I've never seen it done. I don't even know if we can do that, honestly. There was a new paper. Are they able to do it here? Actually, no, what? And, uh, there was a new paper a couple yeah. weeks ago about it, and I asked the nephrologist here, and they said that the problem is you can't reliably predict the response, and so yeah. it's all over the map. Yeah, most people do the 3%. I mean, if you wanted to, though, yes, you could do that. It would be an interesting thing to try maybe in a heart failure or cirrhotic patient. That might be an interesting scenario to try it. So, yeah, it'd probably work there, and I don't think you'd have the same volume issues as giving them 3%. So, but as a general rule, most of the time people don't do that, but, yes, you're right, that could work. Or in, like, a more chronic SIDH promoting, like, a high-protein diet. Sorry, what? In, like, a more chronic SIDH problem promoting, like, a high-protein diet. Yeah, I mean, improving their BUN would help, yes. So if they have poor nutritional status, yes, definitely. Because too low definitely can make you hyponatremic. I don't know that I've read a paper on that, but that certainly seems like a good idea. Yeah, I would think that would definitely help. Um, and most of the people I've had, I usually can control them with salt tablets, and then some people will add a low dose of Lasix. Notice it's not 40. We're not trying to lower their volume. We're trying to, again, make them waste sodium, and water always follows sodium, so it does help. It also tends to help prevent the swelling they get with the tablets. So usually if you do the tablets, you'll give them a low dose of Lasix along with that. And then last ditch, you can do Tolbat then, you start at 15, and you would titrate that up to a max of 60. That's super expensive. That'd probably be like pulling teeth with pharmacy. 
but that is an option. Urea too, I don't know if you can even do that here right now, but yeah. Um, okay, so real quick, I'll try to go through hypernatremia. So hypernatremia has the same general diagram, a little different. If we have hypervolemic hyponatremia, and it's the same physiologic idea, we have a water issue here. So in this case, we have too little water, right, for hypernatremia. It's not really about our body sodium. We can give it to someone by giving them excessive doses of sodium because if we give them too much sodium without free water, again, they remove the sodium from their body and they remove free water. So you can get it in ICU patients who've been on high rates of normal saline for a protracted period. That's why after initial resuscitation, when someone's good, um, if they're not able to take PO, you're supposed to switch them to maintenance fluid, which has more free water in it. Uh, you can also get it if you decided to drink seawater. Hopefully no one does that, but again, you, it's just like taking the salt tablets, only in this case you weren't hyponatremic to start with. Okay, hypovolemic is the same cause as hypervolemic, but now I'm not drinking. You actually lose more water with vomiting, sweating, and diarrhea than you actually lose sodium and cause, uh, uh, so, well, it wouldn't matter for that anyway, but so if you don't drink and you do these things, you actually become hypernatremic. And again, that's why I'm saying when someone's not eating or drinking well, they tend to become hypernatremic, which is again, lack of oral intake. And then we could be losing a whole lot of free water through usually excessive glucose. Could again, if we were giving people mannitol repeatedly, things like that. So if we're pulling lots of free water off through us or substances, we can get an issue. And then the euvolemic cause, what we're really worried about is diabetes insipidus. Um, that would be either central from pituitary or hypothalamic issues, or it could be in a patient who has nephrogenic. The most important thing for your boards to memorize is lithium, which causes nephrogenic. That's the leading cause in the US, really. You can't get it with amyloid. And then hypercalcemia, you frequently will see these patients be a little minorly on the hypernatremic side because of the pull it exerts. All right, last thing, and this is the thing I see most at Louisville. We have a significant issue with our nutrition service here. Um, I didn't see this at the VA as much. But you guys order tube feeds, and I see it all the time, especially for unit patients, and no one ordered free water. I've seen that repeatedly where I get a patient, their sodium's climbing up, and like they're on tube feeds, and I go, do they have free water? And it's like, yeah, they, well, let's call up the order, and we call it up, and there's no free water. So make sure you pay close attention to your tube feeds, whether the patients have free water or not. I've had a bunch of people get up to 150 before we realized they didn't have free water in their tube feeds. Um, the other thing you can do in the ICU, this is why the humidifier is on, you can lose a lot of water through your respiratory secretion. So in the ICU, you need humidifiers, and if people are on tube feeds, you need to be giving them again about 800 cc's of milliliters of water per day, right? So about 300 per shift, three times a day. Or you could lowball it with 250, which would be 750 per day. Um, DI, again, these are the causes. Most cases are idiopathic, but if someone had trauma, hypoxic brain damage, like an ICU patient, and then sarcoid, um, they can get it. I have seen a couple sarcoid cases. And then nephrogenic DI, most cases are caused by lithium. Hopefully all this hereditary stuff is in kids. We won't really see it. All right, so how do we di diagnose it? DI would be something that could be on your board exam. Um, so in a DI case, generally the urine output should be quite high. So if you have someone whose urine output looks very excessive, that's the clue. And most people with DI actually don't have hypernatremia they have polyuria and polydipsia because when, as soon as they start becoming hypernatremic, they get thirsty and they drink a lot. So that's usually the actual complaint. So if the sodium is more than 145, and so then what we would do is decide are they hypernatremic or are they unatremic? So if it's a polyuria question, we make them become hypernatremic by not letting them drink. So basically we make the person NPO and then we serially check their osmolarity, serum and urine and we see what's happening, and these are the stop criteria. So basically, if they become hypernatremic, then they probably have DI. If the person gets a serum osmolarity that's over 300, that's a pretty high osmol without hyperglycine or anything, then that means they're peeing off way too much water. And if their urine osmol um, becomes normal, and what I meant by normal, I should have a number, is if it's over 600, that's what I should do if I'm not drinking. That's why I don't get these other issues. So if I do the normal response, I can stop it because I clearly don't have DI. And then if it remains at the same urine osmol, but my serum osmol is shooting up on multiple checks, that's again a sign that I'm not doing what I should do. My urine osmol literally should start going up towards that 1700 if I'm not drinking. If the person's already hypernatremic, I don't need to fluid restrict them. They already have a problem. So I just check the urine osmolarity. If it's more than 600, then that's what should be happening. So they're just missing free water. We forgot it in their tube feed, something like that. 
if I check it and it's less than 300, I know they have an issue. And if they're in that 300 to 600 range, it's kind of iffy. They could have that. They could have a little bit of hyperglycemia or something messing up my test results. Um, and I can consider additional testing with, uh, with uh, uh, sodium challenge. If I do treatment for hypernatremia, the goal is to change them about 10 to 12 for 24 hours. I just wrote 10 up here. Uh, there's not really a big risk if you overcorrect in these cases. Um, you could get brain swelling. It's mostly in pediatrics. We don't really worry about it as much in adult medicine. Uh, and you calculate the free water deficits. You guys have these calculators. The one thing I'm going to say for you guys is when you're doing this with these calculators now, do not do the default. Um, I've seen residents do this repeatedly where they overcorrect people. If you put in the, the default thing, you put it in and it says target sodium and you put in and it has 140 and the person's 170, then whatever number it gives you is to make them 170 to 140. And I don't want to do that. So classically, you could get that number and then divide it up by groups of 10 to see how much to give each day. But I see residents don't do that. Mathematically, the simplest thing is just take whatever their current sodium is, subtract 10, and put that in as your target. And then that'll give you the daily thing and then each day calculate it. The other problem I see that people don't realize is if the person's NPO and they're not able to eat or drink, they had a daily requirement for free water as well. So remember to add about 800 to a liter of extra water on top of whatever that equation gives you. Otherwise, you're always behind it. Did that make sense? All right. And then if they had NG tube suctioning, if they were having diarrhea, you might need to add even more free water on top of whatever you get from those equations. So the equation is assuming everything's stable and they're eating and drinking everything else. Okay, let's try to go through a couple cases real quick. Sorry, I, I, did, I thought my lecture was at one, so I was very late. But 56-year-old, uh, these are all real cases I've had, by the way. I've changed some of the data to protect the innocent, et cetera, but uh, these are real scenarios. So 56-year-old guy was itching. He took a Benadryl, it didn't work, so he took five Benadryls. He couldn't pee. He was found on the floor having seizures after drinking a gallon of water to try to protect his kidneys. We actually wrote this up with the resin. This is in a journal. Um, and then the patient uh, had a segment of 115. He's on no seizure, psych drugs, or hydrochlorothiazide. Clinical exam, he appeared to be euvolemic. So test number one for hyponatremia is always the serum osmol. It was low, so that's what we expect it to be, nothing funky there. So what was the urine osmol? It was 56. So 56 means this patient had what? So it's a low urine sodium, which means... Sorry, I mean, it's a, sorry, it's a low urine osmol, which means this patient's ADH was low. Or, so this has to be either low solute or polydipsia, right? For just from the case scenario looking at it, which one makes the most sense for this patient? Yeah. But we can look at his BUN, and his BUN was 18. All right? So this patient had polydipsia. He chugged a bunch of water. And so this is a euvolemic hyponatremia from polydipsia. This patient got a Foley catheter. He had one and a half liters of urine in his bladder at the time they placed it, and his sodium corrected immediately. So you might say, why didn't we give desmopressin or anything like that? It's because he had an acute event. You really don't have to worry about central pontine myelinolysis unless it's been protracted. So a guy who did this scenario, you really don't have to worry about it. That's what I'm saying. It depends upon the acuity, too, on whether you really have to worry about the rate of correction. Um, so anyway, this, this gentleman illustrates a really important point. If you do find a case of someone with polydipsia, over 90% of those cases also have bladder outlet obstruction. It's very hard for you to drink too much water. You tend to pee very well. So you have to drink like 12, 17 liters a day of water. Most people don't do that. So usually it's they have renal failure coexisting or they have a bladder outlet obstruction. We had a guy on the psych floor one time was drinking from the water fountain every five minutes. He had dementia. And then we checked it, and he was retaining urine, like he had BPH. He had a little bit of mild renal failure. So pay attention to that aspect of it. It's not just drinking too much water. Or that girl who did Wii for the Wii, where she drank gallons of water to try to run a free Wii game control console. And the contest was to drink as much water as you could without peeing. That creates dangerous polydipsia. They had a seizure, and they died. So don't, yeah, they died. Don't, don't hold your pee and drink a bunch of water. It's stupid. All right. So anyway, so again, if you get a polydipsia case, investigate urinary retention or renal failure. Don't, don't just say it's polydipsia. All right, and that's what that, the article we did, that's why it got published, was reinforcing that point. 86-year-old, 
A demented patient presented with confusion. He had a sodium of 125, no meds at home. He appears slightly hypervolemic with 2 plus bilateral edema. edema. We get a serum osmol. It's less than 280. Therefore, it is expected. Like nothing weird. So then we look at his urine osmol. His urine osmol is 72. So that is less than 100. That means the patient has low solute or polydipsia. We don't have any clear history of polydipsia. We still don't know in this case. So we look at his BUN. All right. You guys can speak. All right. BUN is 3. So was that less than four, 4 or less, which is our red flag? So it was. So this patient, we don't have a case of polydipsia. We can watch him in the hospital. This is probably a low solute state. So this gentleman was actually a patient we had. Um, this is either tea and toast or beer. The patient had no signs of alcohol abuse, no history of alcohol abuse. He was demented. Um, social work got involved, and it turned out he, his, he was living off uh, Coca-Cola and Rice Krispies. He didn't eat anything else. So he had tea and toast. He also, by the way, his leg swelling was interesting because he actually had scurvy. I left off some of the other findings. He had scurvy because he wasn't getting by. He had a whole bunch of things. His teeth were falling out. It was a big mess. So, all right, and so how do we treat him? It's not an emergency situation. He's not less than 120, no seizures. He had dementia to explain his stuff, and it wasn't a severe obtundation. So we just fluid restricted him, and we gave him insure with meals, and as his BUN came up, his sodium improved. So, all right, 72-year-old came to the ER with confusion and gait disturbance. Sodium was 114, so this is severe. Patient had mild acute renal failure, denied any new symptoms, not on HUT seizure drugs or Sykes drugs. He appeared slightly hypovolemic. We got his serum osmol, it's as expected. We get his urine osmol, it's over 100, that's all I care about. So it's over 100, so it's not T and toast, polydipsy, I've crossed some of the things off my list. Look at his urine sodium, which is a surrogate for his aldosterone, it's 19. So that's less than 20. That would suggest that the patient is hypervolemic or hypervolemic. He did have edema on his legs, so maybe, I think I said that. No, I don't think I did say that. All right, patient's uric acid. So we get the uric acid back and it's three. So even though the sodium was less than 20, this looks like a bogus result. So this is someone who is euvolemic with a high aldosterone state. So in this case, we would next look at the TSH and cortisol were eubulimic, right? Okay, TSH was within normal limits, slightly high, but it has to be really high to affect the patient. Cortisol in this case was 17. I put this in to not make it a perfect case. It's not quite the 18 you'll read on up to date. So you should technically do a cosentrobin, but off that receiver operator curve, there's a very low probability of this being it. I'd probably let this one go unless he had a bunch of other findings that supported adrenal insufficiency. So in this gentleman, it was dangerously low, so euvolemic hyponatremia. Um, he had no obvious causes, so we did do a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis in this patient, and we found a tumor in his supraclavicular area, and on biopsy, it was Merkel cell, which is neuroendocrine tumor of the skin, which is really rare. So it's a pretty cool case. So again, most of the time you strike out when you look for something in these cases, but we did find something in this one. All right, and then with the treatment for this patient, he's symptomatic, but he's not having seizures, he's not obtunded, so he should get the, the aliquots every six hours. I wouldn't do the front loading in this case. All right, and then fluid restriction, and he, this patient ended up on salt tablets. Um, actually, I think that patient ended up on a Vaptan. I think he actually ended up on Tolvaptan eventually. We did salt tablets and it didn't work. A uh, 46-year-old came in, he was hyponatremic. Um, he has these other lab values. He's hypokalemic as well, hypochloremic, and he has a metabolic alkalosis. The patient is on hydrochlorothiazide at home. He has no seizure drugs. He appears to be hypovolemic. Again, that's what we expect. Urine osmo is not less than 100, so we don't really care. Urine sodium in this case is high. Okay, so that would suggest euvolemic, but the patient looks hypovolemic, and he is on hydrochlorothiazide. So probably this is what I was warning you about, and the boards do like these hydrochlorothiazide questions because you can get either sodium result. So in this case, um, he looks euvolemic, but this is probably the hydrochlorothiazide. So in this case, you would give the patient uh, Q6 hours BMP with normal saline, maybe desmopressin. And in this case, when the patient got normal saline, they actually corrected way too fast. They, this patient ended up on D5W, but he didn't have the desmopressin at that point. So. That's one of those hypovolemic from hydrochlorothiazide. Patient presents for a short, oh, by the way, one last thing on that case. Uh, make sure you list hydrochlorothiazide as an allergy. 
because that person left, it was all over to discharge somebody with a PCP, reordered hydrochlorothiazide for them for blood pressure at their next visit, and they got readmitted like two months later. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty ridiculous. All right. Patient presents with shortness of breath, uh, abdominal distension, has known cirrhosis, exam shows ascites and leg edema, sodium is 123. So again, what we expect, urine osmol over 100, so I'm not thinking of any of those causes. Urine sodium in this case is less than 20. So this is hypervolemic, hypovolemic, and it matches the history. We look at the uric acid, the uric acid was 10, so it's over four, so we'd say it's probably a true value. And so we'd say this is from this patient's cirrhosis. In this case, we would look at the patient and he's not having any major symptoms or anything real severe. We could give 3% in a cirrhotic case if we had to. Heart failure is the one where it's a bigger problem. We fluid restrict the patient. We try to diurase him with their diuretics. Um, again, if he was symptomatic, you could consider a Baptan as alternative. In cirrhosis, though, you could get away with 3% normal saline. They'll just, their ascites will get worse. Heart failure, you have to use a Baptan in these kind of scenarios. All right. And I'll try to do one more and we'll quit. 32 year old diabetic, admitted for alter, well, I want to do one more after this. Alternating hyperglycemia. Everyone in here should say what the answer is. This is hyperosmolar or hyponatremia, right? Okay, I did a serum osmol example, but really we should look at the glucose first when we correct for it. The real sodium, I think, is like 141. So in this case, we would just treat the hyperglycemia. Um, this is a, a case I had that was very unfortunate that was missed for a while. So the 49-year-old with metastatic melanoma. The patient was admitted to the hospital with confusion, found to be in shock, went to the ICU, placed on pressors. These were his initial labs with hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, and an anion gap acidosis, which is a red flag for something. And then the patient um, was having great difficulty with their shock. Before I saw him, the patient's urine osmol. Uh, serum osmol looked like that, not impressive. Urine osmol didn't tell us anything. Urine sodium was 78 in this case. So this looks like a euvolemic case. So you look at this case and we order a TSH and a cortisol and the cortisol was 1.8. That was below our board's question three, right? Or some people write 3.5. So that person has severe adrenal insufficiency. And actually what happened, uh, we got a CAT scan on this patient. He had bilateral adrenal nuts. So remember that in your cancer patients. About 20% of patients uh, with adenocarcinomas at least get adrenal mets during the course of their disease. This was melanoma, but any cancer can do that. So especially as we're getting more blue medicine patients, keep an eye out for this kind of stuff. This was an oncology patient back when they had their own service. So just make sure you look for those things. All right, and this patient was treated with hydrocortisone. His blood pressure improved, but he actually had another issue and he ended up dying. But 